Sir, uh, just take on the start officer. After uh, finish the video, you can uh, speak start. Assalamu alaikum, uh, dear chairperson, respected chairperson, assalamu alaikum, dear participants, and there are lots of panelists here, especially Professor Abdul Rahman sir, and uh, Professor Said Rahman, Samal Rahman Choudhury, Dr. Timmy Pal from USA, and uh, lots of eminent panelists from the home and abroad. Welcome to today's Ethnic Manual Series 4. Today's speaker, Dr. Khalifu Jaman, uh, he's the, one of the uh, favorite teacher and also in the in Bangladesh, working in NH, uh, Dhaka Medical College Hospital as a assistant professor of cardiology. Dr. Khalikud Jamal will talk today's session. Welcome, Dr. Khalikud Jamal. Uh, thank you for your kind <laughs> session. I'm requesting Professor Abdul Aziz Chaudhary to give the opening remark. Yeah, yeah. Professor Abdul Aziz Chaudhary. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to everybody. Uh, learned speaker and the very learned panelist from home and abroad. Uh, it's really our pleasure to invite you all to today's lecture. This is very important for the fellows because angioplasty you can do, but 
the thing is you have to do it very properly and for hey, I'm why you should prepare the patient why should you do the angioplasty we should have a very clear idea of how and when what to do about these things today with a brilliant academic and a very good orator, he will be speaking about all these things. And I hope the learned panelists who are present here, they'll be contributing uh, from their experience, from their knowledge, to enrich all of us. Because Dr. Khalikun Jaman is really our pleasure to invite you to give you a lecture. Thank you. Uh, Khalid Jaman, sir, please study your lecture and screen share. Uh, today's topic is the from the beginning of the angioplasty, that is indication of angioplasty. And most important thing, preparation of the patient for angioplasty regarding antiplatelets and anticoagulants, also diabetic patient. And then most important part, part is the follow-up of the patients and drug management after PCI. Uh, this is the most important topic because if you do not prepare the patients properly and give the follow-up patient, you lost the patients. Professor Kaliko Javan, uh, thank you. Please unmute yourself. Khalik Bhai, unmute yourself. Khalik Jaman, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Respected, respected IPDI president, general secretary, my respected teachers, senior and junior. And the colleagues and the very learned audience here today, and the students of the fellows which are in front of the uh, today's presentation. Very good evening. Salam alaikum. Thanks, Dr. Moshin Ahmed and Professor Abdul Abid Choudhury, for a nice introduction for me. And the topics which have been selected for me is definitely very important for all the person because we are doing the all the procedure very nicely, but if you don't prepare the patient adequately, you may lose the patient even in the PCI table. And if the follow-up is not adequate, and the follow-up in the ward by the doctors, nurses, and the interventionalist who is doing the procedure is not proper enough, then the patient uh, will develop several complications. So in time, Assessment, proper assessment, proper diagnosis is very important to tackle the complications as well. So let us start with our today's lectures or today's presentation. Indication of the angioplasty. Uh, basically, angioplasty encompasses a broad spectrum of the procedures before going into the other definite procedure, particularly the stenting. Although the angioplasty, once upon a time, only the only the single method for, for producing revascularization procedure, but subsequently the angioplasty become an adjuvant part of the total uh, ECI procedure. Uh, so can we, can you can you First indication of the angioplasty. Angioplasty is a basically a technique of mechanically widening of a narrow or obstructed blood vessel, typically as a result of atherosclerosis with the help of a balloon dilatation. So angioplasty may be of different types depending on the location of the narrowing of the arteries. So we are the cardiologists, we are dealing with the coronary arteries, the peripheral arteries, as well as some bodies are also involved in the carotid arteries. So when there is narrowing of the coronary artery, as well as narrowing of the other arteries of the body, there is question of dilatation by balloon 
is a good option for production or producing restoration of the blood supply in that particular region. So angioplasty does not literally mean coronary, rather it means angioplasty procedure uh, performing upon the other arteries if there is narrowing and there is significant narrowing and obstruction to the flow of the blood to other parts of the body as well. If we think about the scenario or the clinical context, how the angioplasties usually are done, then we find in our despite optimal medical therapy, if the patient having angina, back to is having, there is significant objective evidence of the ischemia, or the patient suffering from unstable angina or non-ST elevated MI, or the patient is suffering from ST elevation MI as a primary percutaneous coronary intervention therapy, or the patient has the persistent or recurrent ischemia after failed thrombolytic therapy, or if the patient after revascularization developed angina like post cvd post pca angina or if the patient has got lv dysfunction with objective evidence of a vessel supplying the myocardium or the patient having arrhythmia recurrent and intractable and the arrhythmia is producing by ischemia of the coronary artery then it is the indication for doing angioplasty literally angioplasty and subsequently uh, basically Thing is that revascularization of the vessel. If we go back to our old other terminologies, the plain old balloon angioplasty is one of the methods for restoration of the blood supply to the affected region of the stenotic coronary artery. And others, if we label that as pre dilatation angioplasty, post dilatation angioplasty, cutting balloon angioplasty, scoring balloon angioplasty drug eluting balloon angioplasty, lithotrix balloon angioplasty, and laser angioplasty, we'll see that the indication will uh, be broadened. If we look about the plain old balloon angioplasty, it is one of the methods which was practiced, standalone practice, about 15 years back. Uh, now, the only balloon angioplasty is limited to those regions where the vessels are very vessels are small one beyond the uh, beyond the capacity or beyond the uh, imp uh, scope for stent implantation near the origin of the side branch from a main branch that is bifurcation sign side, side branch where there is kissing balloon dilatation technique if there is a long diffuse lesion and the landing zone identification becomes difficult, then only the PUVA may be only therapy for those particular vessels. If there is a need for non cardiac surgery within very short time and the continuation of the dual or single ventricular becomes a cumbersome thing to continue, then balloon angioplasty will make the thing very easier to perform the surgery within two weeks of the performing the balloon angioplasty. That it, a good option. Uh, third, if continuation of the dual interplatelet therapy is a contraindication or the patient develops bleeding complication, if there is anticipation of like that, then the only balloon old angioplasty is a good option for that particular case. The pre dilatation, usually, uh, if you consider the pre dilatation angioplasty, it is usually practiced in those cases where there is a difficulty in. There is anticipation of the difficulty in crossing the lesion. So before crossing the lesion, there is preparation of the vascular bed for easy negotiation, easy placement, and easy expansion uh, of the stand. We have to do the pre-dilatation angioplasty. Or in those cases where there is difficulty to estimate the current reference size of the vessel, where there is diffuse disease or rapidly tapering vessel, then there is a there should have pre-dilatation angioplasty. Is the aim of the post dilatation angioplasty it is a technique where dilatation of the stent and segments of the blood vessel after placement of the stent with the help of a non compliant bill. It ensures you see the full stent expansion, position, maximum luminal area, which ultimately leads to development of reduction in the total vessel, revascularization, and stent thrombosis. Very much important. 
is now a practice, routine practice in all the lesions, but it carries more significance in those cases where there is complex lesion subset, particularly bifurcated lesion, calcified lesion, long lesion, long stem. The cutting balloon angioplasty, here the balloon dilatation with the help of a special balloon catheter having three or four microsurgical blades bonded longitudinally to its surface, indicated in the complex lesion, particularly the osteal lesion and the calcified lesion as well as fibrotic lesion. And those patients who develop instant restenosis. Here the balloon are a bit, uh, profile is a bit larger profile balloons are used and the negotiation of the balloons across the lesion a bit difficult. And to overcome this problem, there is scoring balloon angioplasty. Here, the metallic microplates are insist in one or more metallic wire, which are able to anchor within the PMIC media, preventing balloon slippage and any geographical miss. And at the same time, wires are able to cut into the areas of the fibrosis. Similar type of lesion we are using like as like as Cutting balloon and just like fibrotic lesion, osteal lesion, calcified lesion, and instant restenosis. Drug eluting balloon angioplasty, where there are conventional semi compliant balloon is there, which is covered with an anti proliferative drugs, notably pectidexin, oscopin, uh, which are released into the vessel wall during inflation of the balloon. And these are indicated again instant restenotic cases, small vessel de novo lesion, long vessel calcified lesion. Bifurcated lesion and higher the diagonalities time and following diagonalities time there is question of long term anti antiplatelet therapy and the bleeding needs then the balloon angioplasty may be option which enables to give a short term and dual antiplatelets. A very promising treatment in the field of the calcified lesion is the lithotripsy balloon angioplasty, the IVL intravascular lithotripsy balloon, which consists of a pulsatile mechanical energy along the length of the balloon, which giving pressure for, uh, around four atmosphere, frequency one hertz. The energy interacts with the atherosclerotic plaque, causing vibration that cracks and fracture the calcific components in both superficial and deep layers. We see the both the superficial and deep layer calcium are cracked here, a very promising uh, treatment option in the field of the severe lichen spectrum. And also sometimes under expanded stents where the, all the techniques fail, then it may be option. And here the learning curve will be uh, short and the lithotripsy balloon negotiation and the profile are a bit comfortable. So it's a good option and coming, it is coming uh, yet not still available in our country, but it's hopefully coming within very few Small, uh, in small time. And lastly, the laser angioplasty, it is not so much practiced, you know, it is not available in your country, not a very good practice all throughout the world. This is all about the indication of the angioplasty. Next, we'll move to patient preparation before the procedure. Number one, inherding admission of the patient to the ward or CCO, CCO or defined area. The point to admit the patient. Patient, there are two options. Patient may be admitted the night before the elective angioplasty or now the trend is there where the elective patients are admitted on the morning of the procedure. Details of the evaluation pre procedure are leveled on, written, and consent should be obtained. Dr. Moshin has emphasized this point about the informed written consent. What is that? Informed written consent is the process in which a healthcare provider educates a patient about the risks, benefits, and alternatives of a given procedure or intervention. The patient must be competent to make a voluntary decision about whether to undergo the procedure or intervention. Informed consent is both an ethical and legal obligation of the medical practitioners. On the other hand, it originates from the patient's right to direct what happens to their body. The following are the required elements for documentation of the informed discussion. 
the nature of the procedure or how the procedure will be performed on the body of the patient it has to be explained in detail to the patient you have to explain about the risks benefits of the procedure not only the benefits at the same time risk at the same time you have to find a reasonable alternative to the patient if anything have you have to explain to the patient about the reasonable alternatives again the risks and benefits of the alternative should be explained to the patient number 5 assessment of the patient's understanding of the elements one to four so the patient should understand all the things we are you are telling about to him so it is the obligation of the provider to make it clear that the patient is participating in the decision making process and avoid making the patient feel forced to agree to with the provider so it should be very much clear it is the obligation of the provider to make it clear that the patient is participating in the decision making process khalik uh, khalik bhai avoid making the patient Khalik bhai sound to act it with the provider Khalik bhai sunchen ki kotha ta ei jinish ta kintu amader pray ghore theke jena Khalik bhai sunchen apni ha ha sunchen apnar okhane theke noise asche ami ektu noise lage kotha theke noise ta asche shona jacche ha noise asche ha ekta noise asche जेनारेटिंग सार्जिकल कन्सलटेंसि what i was emphasizing on the angioplasty should be attempted only by the experienced operator uh, generally only in a setting where the full cardiac surgical and anesthetic support is available with the exception of the primary percutaneous coronary intervention although there are controversy about the setup you know all the times it is not true uh, whether it is a controversial issue for the interventional cardiologist necessity for ad hoc pci may be stressed or discussed with the patient and his attendants necessity for stress procedure may be discussed in selected cases in non emergency situation in technically complex difficult cases additional discussion with the patient and the family may, may be needed in high risk cases it is better to make a surgical consultancy before angioplasty patient should be counseled on the need for and risks for dual antiplatelet therapy before placement of stent 
i think this is very much vital issue after the placement of the stent when you start the dual antiplatelet therapy patient develops bleeding complication so neither you can omit the dual antiplatelet nor you can continue so that is creating a problem for the patient so this should be discussed with the patient before going to the intervention and second thing that the cost of the dual antiplatelet therapy continuation particularly the ticket below it takes a huge cost and huge economic economic burden on the part of our patient population so before treating the patient with dual antiplatelet therapy it has to be discussed with the patient with particular emphasis on that point alternative therapy should be pursued if patients are unwilling or unable to comply with the recommended duration of the dual antiplatelet সুতরাং এমন যাতে না হয় হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ আপনি করবেন না আপনি চলে যান ঠিক আছে বাড়ি চলে যান আমরা আপনার কিছু করব না এমন যাতে না হয় কারণ এখানে পেশেন্টকে তার অল্টারনেটিভটাও তাকে সুযোগ করে দিতে হবে ইফ দ্য পেশেন্ট ইজ নট কমপ্লাইং উইথ ইউ রিকমেন্ডেড ট্রিটমেন্ট প্রোটোকল অ্যান্ড দেন দি পেশেন্ট অ্যাজ এ পার্ট অফ দ্য পেশেন্ট অ্যাসেসমেন্ট ইউ হ্যাভ টু অ্যাসেস দ্য পেশেন্ট হাই দ্য পেশেন্ট ইজ কন্ট্রাস্ট ইন দি and you should treat or prepare the patient accordingly if there is any risk oral intake should be restricted after the midnight and there should be ensure a good dose before the procedure these are diabetes what is about the diabetes status glycemic status of the patient what is about the risk of the cn if the patient has got renal impairment in any form if the patient has got contrast nephropathy uh, allergy to the contrast material does the patient is suffering from infection local or systemic either in laboratory abnormalities in the form of clotting factors platelet count anemia electrolyte imbalances if the patient has got evidence of heart failure if the patient has got evidence of peripheral vascular disease either involving the vasculature of the upper limb or the lower limb where you, you are going to intervene so where you are going to intervene either radial or femoral if the patient has got abdominal aortic aneurysm what is about the blood pressure status of the individual and lastly coagulopathy when you are preparing a patient having diabetes mellitus you have to take a serious consideration to the matter because the uncontrolled diabetes leads to the development of diabetes it is due due to the stress factor of the coronary intervention in one hand in other hand it uncontrolled blood sugar will lead to development of perioperative or peripheral complication beginning from infection to stent thrombosis the diabetes should be well controlled prior to the elective intervention and the patient diabetic care provider should be involved in the management of the patient if it is possible patient and among all the drugs it is the metformin which has to be omitted at least 24 hours 24 to 48 hours before the angioplasty procedure to avoid the development of metformin induced lactic acidosis blood sugar should be maintained in general in between 140 to 180 mg per dl in the peri procedure if the patient is only on diet and his blood sugar is oil he had or his blood pressure is oil controlled then no specific therapy is required only for angioplasty or the procedure but more frequent blood sugar monitoring during the peri procedure period is recommended and should be sought for and during the procedure blood sugar should be checked hourly patient for hyperglycemic in peri procedure period may need subcutaneous insulin in some in some in some cases if the patient is an oral hypoglycemic agent other than metformin this has been omitted 24 to 48 hours before like uh oral hypoglycemic agent in other other format like dimerol mr or dimecron mr or compared like that stop the medication on the day of the procedure and restart the medication anti diabetic medication when the patient is able to resume the normal diets or meals subcutaneous insulin may be required in the post procedural period if the blood sugar exceeds our target level the diabetic patient who are having insulin before the procedure 
in the morning of the procedure they should omit the short acting insulin very much important and reduce the dose of the intermediate or long acting insulin by 50% so all the insulin preparation need not to be omitted at the same time that will increase the risk of hyperglycemia to the patient and next if the patient is having premix insulin preparation so reduce the evening dose before the day of the procedure by 20% on an average and the morning dose by 50% Those patients who has got nephropathy, a rising creatinine in general reason to defer the elective cardiac catheterization. In a patient on dialysis, catheterization is generally timed immediately after dialysis. In a patient with stable but severe renal failure, catheterization may be performed with an awareness of the increased risk of the needing dialysis to the patient. Isosmolar contrast use, small volume contrast use, and the proper hydration is the mainstay to prevent contrast in nephropathy. In this pertinent issue, pertinent issue uh, we who are working in the government level hospital, at the limitation of the resources as well as the majority of the people are poor, the dialysis before intervention or angioplasty, dialysis after angioplasty, that will put a heavy, huge economic burden to the patient, cannot be afforded all the time. So it is not as like at the private institute that the renal failure is not a contraindication for uh, intervention. Definitely, it is correct. But how will tackle the situation? If it is a monetary problem, then dialysis before, after, and more than that, that is very much difficult to manage this patient. Not only that, the patient with low develop contrast in this nephropathy also is more likely to develop, uh, to develop stent thrombosis at the same time, more likely to, to, be, to develop hemorrhagia in different sites. So how will tackle the situation? That is a very big problem for us. So we have to be very cautious before handling with the patient suffering from renal failure. So again, the question of motivation to the patient, explanation to the patient, and concern from the part of the patient is very essential here. Dialogy, you know, all the things is very, once you see the patient who has dialogy in the table, you see the patient as severe bronchospasm, patient level of hypotension in the table. So once you see a patient having dialogy, you will never forget to treat those patients before going into the cath lab. So pre-medication, what are those drugs? You can give oral drugs, you can give intravenous drugs. Definitely steroids, antihistamine, and also H2 blockers are the mainstay of treatment. It should be started at least 24 hours before the procedure to take it because it is a hydrocortisone which takes about four to six hours to give its full action. So it should be given at least six hours before the procedure. Infection, we have to understand the clinical evidence of the infection. Always the active infection is the reason to defer the elective cardiac catheterization because it will make the procedure cumbersome, it will produce septicemia and so on. And not only the periprocedural outcome related to the stand, uh, will produce catastrophe, but at the same time, patient general respiratory, cardiac, renal, all things will be aggravated in presence of a infection. A mild local infection can disseminate, can produce septicemia and so on. So it is very important. Local skin infection at the side of the potential puncture site is also undesirable. Fungal infection in the groin is a very common phenomena when you are doing with the femoral approach. So this is particular concern in obese patient. In those cases, either patient should be treated first or you switch over to the radial approach. Alternatively, angioplasty may perform for radial approach in patient with fungal infection in the groin increases. When you go through the lab investigation, if you see the patient is anemic, in our sitting, we are doing the procedure, elective procedure, and hemoglobin is around 10 gram per DL. But somehow it is written if the patient is asymptomatic and hemoglobin is around 8 gram per DL, you can proceed with the, your plan of doing angioplasty. Uh, if it is needed, then you can, you have to need some transmission in peri-interventional period. If the patient is hypokalemic, so it should be corrected because during procedure, it will enhance the susceptibility to develop ventricular atrial arrhythmia, which will make the procedure very difficult for us. In hyperkalemia also. 
in presence of digital toxicity while the patient is getting digitally side up for atrial fibrillation or deep heart failure then in presence of the toxicity catheterization is best deferred because it is induced again arrhythmias decompensated heart failure never be uh, should not be attempted to this patient until there is ventilatory support in other hand if it is acute case and patient is suffering from stmi myocardial infarction or non stmi myocardial infarction with intractable failure then you will have all the facilities available for ventilatory support you may go on but in stable cases and elective cases you have to optimize the treatment and at least patient should be symptom free and he or she should be able to lie supine without any respiratory difficulties when you are treating the patient severe peripheral vascular disease again an inadequate lower extremity pulse favors an upper extremity approach and the vice versa if there is a upper extremity pulse problem go to the lower extremity and control hypertension is not very much big issue because it can be controlled during perioperative period by intravenous drugs this is a very great concern when the patient is on vitamin k antagonist or nuac or duac this is very important because the patient having risk factor uh, like atrial fibrillation documented from the embolism documented from the in the lv or la or if the patient has got artificial mechanical prosthetic heart valve then consider it, then patient will have vitamin k antagonist or nuac or duac some form so what will do this is the one thing and another thing is that if the patient has got thrombocytopenia severe one if it is goes below 50000 it will increase the risk of the bleeding so you have to correct it if the patient is heparinized prior to the procedure so it should be stopped for 2 to 6 hours before the procedure if the patient is low molecular weight of heparin stop it 8 to 12 hours before the procedure if the patient is nuac or duac or vitamin k antagonist there are two option if the patient necessity for if you think that necessity for continuation of the anticoagulants is not very much important then you can withdraw the warfarin at least 72 hours before the procedure and do the procedure when inr comes below 1.6 and similarly if the patient is getting nuac it should be omitted at least 24 hours before the procedure and do the angioplasty accordingly option 2 is that if the patient is getting warfarin and the inr is more than 2 you can do the procedure of angioplasty or intervention without any added heparin infusion definitely in those cases you have to choose or you have the default technique should be in the radial approach you can do that and on the other hand if patient is getting nuac you can continue the nuac and perform the procedure with the radial approach with a reduced dose of the heparin intravenous heparin in during procedure and you have to keep you have to keep the ACT in between 250 to 300 ml now we are switching over to pre medications a very vital issue for management of the patient and during cath lab procedure you see the, the patient develop you are putting the stand in the led it become occluded from bus you are putting the stand in the lcx it become occluded into from bus and i will take retrograde retrogradely you take the history that patient fails to take the antiplatelet therapy in the previous night so it will produce a nightmares in your procedure in the cath lab so be sure that all the antiplatelet agents and the drugs has been taken by the patient it should be confirmed what are those drugs these drugs not only smoothen the procedure rather they will produce a favorable impact on the stent patterns in the long run as you are so what are those drugs these are antiplatelet agents definitely how the aspirin plays the vital or central role and also the p2y12 antagonist idol statin either from continuation of the statin therapy or a pre procedural high dose statin overload and lastly metabolic modulators which is the trimetazidim and ranolazin these are drugs which in certain studies shows favorable impact on the peripheral outcome 
in terms of reduction of the perioperative myocardial infarction uh, has been proved in certain studies but guideline does not recommend these drugs to administer prior to the development prior to the procedure so antiplatelet drugs is the cornerstone for survival of the stroke and aspirin is the central drug for antiplatelet all among the only, uh, all the antiplatelet so irrespective of the status if the patient is not on chronic aspirin therapy patient should have a loading dose of 300 to 325 mg if the patient is on chronic aspirin therapy a bit lower dose is permissible but he may take up to 325 mg it should be non enteric it should be taken in chewing when should rapid ablation it is better as soon as you prescribe or uh, allow the patient to take it at least 2 hours is better to have uh, take the to take the aspirin at least 2 hours before the procedure and the maintenance dose is 75 to 160 mg once a day it has been shown that 30 to 50 mg of aspirin doses is sufficient enough to produce full inhibition of the thrombexin 2 production the 75 mg is a very, very good maintenance dose for this patient for all the patients clopidogrel 300 to 600 mg loading dose uh, it should be taken as soon uh, as possible before the procedure or at least after the coronary anatomy is made. When the patient is uh, when, when the patient is taking the uh, clopidogrel closer to the period or closer to the time of the intervention, then large dose is necessary. And when it is taken previously, then 300 milligram is enough. And the maintenance dose is 75 milligram orally once a day. Prasugels, you see, the 60 milligram is a loading dose. It should not be prescribed previously, rather. As soon as you know the coronary anatomy and the patient is prepared for uh, for interventional treatment, then you have to administer the rasugrel. Maintenance is 10 milligram. If the patient or it is less than 60, you can consider 5 milligram per day. Ticagrelor is the main stay of treatment now, particularly in acute coronary syndrome setting. While the loading dose in 180 milligram, better to give at least two hours before the procedure and maintenance is 90 milligram twice daily. And higher, you need to continue the ticagrelor more than one year, then come the question of 60 milligram twice daily for the rest of the time you, you want to give the patient the ticagrelor. GP2B3 inhibitor, these are indications coming lower down. Only now, these are prescribed as a bailout strategy during intervention. If there is any slow flow, no flow, you can prescribe the patient. But in routine practice, these are not practiced. Cangrelor, this is again is chosen uh, when the patient is undergoing PCI who had not received oral E2Y12 inhibitor or in whom the oral therapy with E2Y12 inhibitor is not feasible or desirable. And sometimes it is bridging before the cardiac surgery, but routine practice yet not recommended. So now come to the point that the central part of the antiplatelet therapy is played by the aspirin loading those 300 to 325 milligram and you may have to choose the clopidogrel in elective cases where you can give 600 milligram loading dose and in acute coronary syndrome setting you have to choose the ticagrelo or prasugrel so this dual antiplatelet therapy is the main backbone for survival of the stroke now we sometimes call triple therapy. What is that? It denotes the treatment with DAPT plus one of the oral anticoagulant, either BKA or NOI. What is dual therapy? It denotes the treatment with single antiplatelet agent with oral anticoagulant, either aspirin or clopidogrel and any of the oral anticoagulants. Here, you see the other P2Y12 inhibitors are not there. Rasugrel and the Ticagrelo are considered very strong antiplatelet agents. So this should not be combined with the oral anticoagulant to avoid hazardous bleeding. Oral anticoagulant, you see the vitamin K antagonist and the NOACO drug is there. And here you see the indications where triple or dual therapy is may be, may be needed in certain cases. 
anticoagulant. Regarding anticoagulant, you see the unfractionated heparin, enoxaparin, Honda perinox, and the GP2B3 meter and the thrombolytics. I'm not going into this next day. Unfractionated heparin is always a good choice. However, we have to keep the ACT during interventional period in between 250 to 300. Yes, the unfractionated heparin is always uh, you are choosing. Enoxaparin is a good option. The last dose of the uh, subcutaneous dose is provided if it is less than eight hours. There is no additional enoxaparin or unfractional heparin should be given. If the last subcutaneous dose is given more than eight hours, additional bolus can be given. Otherwise, 0 0.5 milligram per kg IV bolus if the patient is not getting within this period. If the patient previously getting thondoperinox, then again the unfractional heparin is a drug of choice. And here, GP to be training should not be given in combination with fondoperinox. Mycolyridine is a good choice once upon a time, although now it has been downgraded as an indication because bivalerudine has been shown to reduce the peri-interventional hemorrhagic complication, particularly where the patients are at more hemorrhagic weeks. And bivalerudine was a good choice at that time. Yet then, it is a very good medicine, but there is a marginal increment in the risk of the stent thrombosis here uh, when are using bivalerudine in some, in some studies. The high-dose statin. The high dose statin, the interventional high dose statin, benefits of the intensive therapy is evident in the ACS patient who underwent PCI. No doubt, better myocardial perfusion of 80 milligram atorvastatin or 40 milligram osuvastatin. We know about that high intensity statin therapy. High dose statin pre treatment on the top of the maintenance dose has favorable impact on post procedural myocardial perfusion by improving TV flow and mass. We have seen uh, several studies have been done in National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. Uh, with pre-treatment with high-dose statin, superimposed on the maintenance dose of the statin. And uh, what is the time before to administer this uh, loading dose of statin? It may, beginning from seven days before the onset of the angioplasty. Beginning of the end of the So it is the two hours to 24 hours, which is more preferable option to give the statin pre treatment high dose loading dose. But uh, there is no recommendation for any guidelines about this high dose statin pre treatment on the top of the maintenance dose. Rather, high dose statin therapy, high intensity statin therapy should be instituted as soon as the patient is diagnosed in the case of coronary artery disease. Uh, the metabolic modulators among these two are trimetazidib and the renolazine. Although L-carnitine was considered to be one of the metabolic modulators, but there is no study in favor of that uh, L-carnitine. Trimetazidib in different doses forms has been shown that it improves the endothelial function, it improves, reduces the myocardial damage in the perioperative or peri-interventional period. So different doses regimen has been factorized in different studies, 20 milligrams three times daily for 24 hours before and after PCI, 60 milligram loading goes two hours prior to the PCI, 20 milligram TDS, 15 days prior and three months after PCI, seven days before intervention and then maintenance. Uh, I, so far I know there are uh, one study done by uh, one of the students in, in ICBD, uh, 60 milligram loading goes before prior to the angioplastic procedure in, in ICBD, which shows reduction of the periprocedural uh, propi release after the procedure, that is cardioprotective effect of the trimetazidine has been proved in different studies, but there is no recommendation from the guidelines. Ranolazine is one form of metabolic modulator, while there is a study where uh, they prescribe 1000 milligram twice daily for seven days, which significantly reduces the procedural Myocardial injury in, in, in elective, sorry, in elective PCI. So the ranolazine and the trimetazidine, it is the operator discretion. You can take decision about their administration, not to administer, not to administer. But different studies have shown sorry, some favorable impact on the very procedural outcome. 
Now, third part of my presentation is post-procedural follow-up and drug management. This is again a vital issue. We are doing procedure in the cath lab, and we are after the procedure, we handed over the patient to a junior doctor, and the doctor bring the patient to CCU or recovery room or post care or you depending on the institution and the their protocol. So the junior doctor come to the place and he will give all the prescription to the patient. If the junior doctor is not trained enough and um, there is or there is no prescribed protocol there, there may be missing because we have to prescribe the patient a lot of drugs which are very essential. Each and every drug is very essential, beginning from antibiotics to laxatives. There will be missing of certain drugs. When you will come on the next day, follow up to see the patient, you will see that either one of the antiplatelets or one of the statins or beta blockers may be omitted from the post procedural order. So you have to very much vigilant uh, about the post procedural follow up on the drug management. That is why Dr. Moshina made a particular emphasis on the drug management in the post procedure period. A very important one. As soon as the procedure is over, prior to arriving on the recovery room, it is very important that the doctor or the nurse taking the patient to that particular ward or the room understand what happened during the procedure. It is very vital. The doctor who is on duty on that particular place. He doesn't know the, what has been done for the patient and what complication has been uh, developed during the procedure. But it has to be informed to the doctor or the nurse. He or she should know what procedure was performed, what axis was used during the procedure, what drug has been given during the procedure, and whether there is any complication during the procedure. So that they can realize the things very early if they happen if any complication happen in that particular recovery room or post -care. And second is safe and effective hemostasis of the vascular access site is the main object, particularly when it is done in the femoral. In the cath lab at the end of the procedure, the hemostasis is done in trans transradial approach. And in transfemoral approach, if you want to use a, a vascular closure device, then it can be done in the in the recovery post cath room, two hours after the procedure, when ACT comes to below 150 seconds, then in the femoral loop, you have to remove the sheet and do the proper hemostasis. That is a, one of the important part of the management in post procedural period because many of the casualties may happen at that period, either local or Due to some development of vesovagal reaction, patient may develop some emergency situation which should be taken immediately, otherwise, you may lose the patient. What should be the position in the post cath or in recovery room? If the procedure has been done in the transfemoral approach, better to find the patient with punctal leg straight and in supine condition, the angle of the body with the bed may be 30 to 45 degree angle to make comfortable to the patient. Keep head down so that the patient does not elevate the head frequently. That will produce a stress or tension over the puncture cell. Definitely, you have to advise the patient to drink plenty of water and hold the groin side if there is any cupping or straining. If in transradial approach, the elbow better to keep the elbow a bit flexed position, wrist partially flexed, forearm supinated, and get toward the chest in a resting condition. The main motto is that the puncture part of the hand should be kept upright. What is about the ambulation? In trans femoral approach, strict bed rest for four to eight hours, and there is manual hemostatic methods, hemostasis with the corona, are in the only for two to four hours if the vascular closure, closure device is used. When there's transradial approach, patient can ambulate immediately after the procedure if the hemodynamics and neurologic status is stable. So it is a very great advantage 
for the patient who are uh, who are on the transradial approach. They are doing the transradial approach uh, for NG plus or other interventional procedure. It is easily chosen by the patient and very much comfortable for the patient. In the post procedural room, you have to monitor the patient. There should be continuous CCC monitoring, continuous NIVP monitoring, continuous oxygen saturation monitoring, care of the puncture site in and around of the to see about, uh, whether there is any active bleeding or any formation of the hematoma. Check the distal pulse and limbs for ischemia, 15 minutes interval for two hours. This is a rough frequency that uh, we have. Roughly, it is like that. But if the patient has got no complication immediately, you can uh, do the follow up a bit more longer period interval. Check the vital signs every 15 minutes for two hours. I should have a sandbag over the groin in femoral puncture cases where the patient has to know that there is something over the right groin. He should not move his limb frequently. Uh, he should not move his limbs or her limbs. When to return to the one? Decision definitely should be individualized, depends on the profession he is working, in which file he is working, what is the performance of him. And again, it depends on the individual psychological status. Driving, refrain from the driving for at least 48 hours or two after the procedure. Sexual activity, refrain from the sexual activity for one week after the procedure for excess site healing, nothing for other reasons. Point to return to the work. Don't participate in strenuous activities two days after the procedure with radial arterial puncture hand. Avoid excessive movement of the limbs where the puncture was performed for next two days in transfemoral approach. Avoid heavy lifting more than 10 pounds after five to 10 days, within five to 10 days following the procedure. Avoid taking long automobile or bicycle rides or hikes for two weeks in transfemoral approach. Point to resume the normal activity, gradually increase the activity, and the normal activity level within one week after the procedure. One person can resume his normal activities in uncomplicated pace and stable human status. A few words about the sheath removal in femoral approach. In radial approach, we are removing the sheath in the cath lab. Either we are doing the hemostasis with the manual compression or somehow it is practiced with the closer devices. Closure device means the inflators with inflate the air, the inflate the and the tear bend the oshakami. Uh, we are doing the hemostasis at that particular period immediately after the procedure. But following the femoral procedure, we have to keep the sheet at least two hours, or in certain cases more than three, four, or five hours even. And we frequently see the ACT. If the ACT comes down to less than 150, then we go to remove the sheet to avoid the bleeding complications. So, what are the equipments needed? You see all the things, you know all the things. How it should be done? Sheet removal after PCI may occur in the lab, in the holding area, or at the patient bedside. What should be the position of the bed? Adjust the, adjust the bed height or use a foot stool. To exert maximum pressure downward for the puncture site compression with minimal fatigue. So it should be vertical. Monitor, you should attach the patient with monitor with continuous CCG monitoring and NIVP monitoring because there is chance of development of esophageal attack and you have to identify it as early as possible to take the situation perfectly. There should be a definitely good IV access because in the face of emergency, you can manage the patient adequately. There should be proper analgesia, either systemic or local. Local analgesia, one person lignocaine to the skin around the sheath, or intervenous analgesia may be given before the sheath removal if the patient is very sensitive. Medication, you have to take all the medication, or the cardiovascular emergency medication should have with you, as well as the emergency trolley with you. Check ACT before removing the sheath and ensure that the heparin has been stopped. And before removing the sheet, be sure that the patient's vital signs are stable. There is no ongoing chest pain, and there are no plans for recatheterization to the patient. And when they remove the sheet, remove the arterial sheet first. There are several reasons for that. What should the duration of the pressure to be applied over the local set? Around 15 to 20 minutes. It again depends on the sheet side, the city, 
and the patient's overall status regarding the bleeding, whether there is any bleeding tendency or not. But one thing is very important. The pressure application should be kept to a minimum to decrease the complication like skin necrosis, nerve compression, or venous thrombosis. Many times we see that the, due to over compression, there is local skin necrosis, exfoliation, and there is formation of a local skin scarring and large ulceration. Sometimes we patient need to take opinion from plastic surgeon. However, I have seen that somewhere there is uh, patient had to go undergo some plastic surgical procedure for this local skin necrosis or muscle necrosis. Now, when to discharge? Very pertinent issue and very complicated issue. Again, decision regarding discharge based on the individual patient's medical scenario. But the following factors should be judged or considered. Is it elective or emergent procedure? Is it has been done on STMI situation or non-STMI situation or elective situation? Either it is done in the femoral root or the radial root, whether the patient was stable during the procedure or periprocedural period, or the patient is unstable in the periprocedural period, and whether hemostasis is done in manual method or device method. So this thing has to be considered. In a patient who is stable, an elective procedure has been done, they can be typically monitored for six hours and then they can be discharged. Outpatient cases. And the patient say, has been performed in HDMI setting. It is better to keep the patient. If the patient has got electrical or other cardiac decompensation, then the patient may need to stay in the hospital for longer time. And the patient has got acute coronary syndrome, non STMI type, then again, up to three days, patient may stay up to three days in the hospital. And PCA in the femoral loop, almost all the cases where there is manual compression, patient should stay in the hospital at least 24 hours after the procedure. And it has been shown in different studies or observational studies that staying more than 24 hours in the hospital and less than 24 hours in the hospital does not produce any difference in terms of outcome of the patient. So this is one of the protocol. So be, before discharging the patient, you have to consider certain things. For the expedition of the discharge, if the patient is stable, baseline mental functional status is good, and medical condition stable, if the patient has a successful procedure and the procedure was not a complex one, hemostasis was good and patient was instituted and the platelet therapy with adequate time and the patient caregiver support at home is adequate and the medical instruction is given to the patient, then patient can be discharged in an expedited protocol. Uh, how the patient has got evidence of renal disease, Angina, contrast allergy, large volume of contrast has been used. There is some bleeding complication. There is very procedural microinfarction. Patient uh, needs atherectomy during the procedure. The home support is not good enough. So, in those cases, you have to consider the patient for more to stay at hospital before discharge. So, during discharge, what are the drugs that are very essential to prescribe? See the antiplatelets, anticoagulants, statins, beta blocker, CIARB, nitrous, plus minus, may or may not be needed, trimetazidine, may or may not be needed, antibiotic, oral or IV, it's your decision, analgesics sometimes or not sometimes, sedatives and relaxatives. Our main focus of discussion is on the antiplatelets and the anticoagulants because the statin, beta blocker, CIARB, you know all the things, all the fellows know better about the statins and the other things better than us. So before considering the dual antiplatelets or anticoagulants, you have to consider many things. Either patient has got increased ischemic risk or risk of stent thrombosis. Some criteria favor shorter duration of the DFPT and some favor longer duration. I'm not going in details in this part, whether I'm switching over to some scoring system. There are several scoring systems. 
GFET score, Vessel GFET score, you have heard the name of Paris score, you have heard the name of Whitey score. So different scoring system is there, but more practical one is GFET score. It is very simple. Vessel GFET score is also very good option because it can be calculated at the time of the corona stenting, but GFET score should be calculated after 12 months of the uneven from GFET. Then you have to take decision either you have to continue or you better to avoid dual enterprises. But research DAPT score should be calculated at the time of the procedure and accordingly you can take the decision. Here you see the scoring score range is 0 to 100 in research DAPT score. I had more than 25 score favored short DAPT, short means around six months, and standard or long DAPT means. 24, 12 to 24 months. In GAPT score pattern, where there is minus 2 to 10 points, total 8 criteria is here. Score more than 2 favors long GAPT means more than 12 months, 24 to 36 months even. And the score is less than 2, standard GAPT, only 12 month GAPT should be prescribed. And here you see the, if the patient has been performed angioplasty or PCI, not angioplasty. With the PCI should stand then GPT for one year in the setting of the STMI or non STMI acute corona syndrome. Aspirin, you see 81 milligram once daily, Ecoglor 90 milligram BD or Prasugel 10 milligram once daily. Definitely, it is preferred over the Propitogrel 75 milligram once daily. At one year, determine the bleeding risk. Better at that time to do the DAPT score. Patient not at high risk of bleeding, continue the DAPT for up to three years. Aspirin 81 milligram once daily plus ticagular 60 milligram. You can reduce the dose 30 milligram plus 30 minutes, 60 milligram. 60 milligram BD or propylical 75 milligram once daily. You have that option at that time. If the patient has got high risk of bleeding, single antiplatelet agent, either aspirin 81 milligram once daily or propylical 75 milligram once daily. And in that particular issue, propylical is better choice than the aspirin alone and there is only single antiplatelet. If the patient has got elective PCI and there is patient is not at high risk of bleeding, then DAPT for uh, elective PCI is six months. And high risk clinical or angiography features for thrombotic cardiovascular risk events, not at high risk of bleeding, with you have extend DAPT up to three years. And if the patient has again high risk of bleeding, then single antiplatelet agent, either aspirin or clopidogrel. If the patient has got high risk of bleeding, DAPT for one month EPMS or three months for DASH. It is an elective PCI setting and single antiplatelet for rest of the time to continue. If the patient has got other indications, higher, apart from DAPT, patient is in need for third another antithrombotic agent in the form of anticoagulants, then you have to calculate the risk again. If the patient has got atrial fibrillation or mechanical prosthetic heart valve, and the patient has been done elective PCI without high risk feature, then calculate the charge or charge heart score. If it is zero, then aspirin and clopidogrel is enough, and duration should be as like as before, one month for the BMS, and at least three months for the DASH, maybe extended up to 12 months. And after that, either a screen or P2 or Y12 will be. If the patient the age is more than 65 and the charge score is more than one, then clopidogrel along with one uh, oral anticoagulant along with clopidogrel. And it, uh, it is better to mention here that uh, in combination with the oral anticoagulants, P2 Y12, other P2 Y12 will need to run more than And the duration is one month of BMS, definitely in active setting and three months for the dish may be extended up to 12 months. And then oral anticoagulant basically, plus minus single anticoagulant. In this case, it is the oral anticoagulant which is preferred. Then addition with single anticoagulant. If the patient has got this indication for antithrombotic as an added anticoagulant agent in high risk feature, high risk elective PCI cases, then you see, the patient may need to continue triple antithrombotic drug, one and oral anticoagulants, aspirin, and in those cases, clopidogrel, not other. 
So aspirin stop one day post PCR or any time up to six months. And this combination, if the patient has got no bleeding tendency and a high thrombotic trend, that these three combination may be continued up to six months, followed by clopidogrel and one of the oral antibodies. And duration after PCR is up to 12 months. And after that, only oral antibodies will get October, a single antiplatelet has been এখানে এমন যদি হয় একটা پیشنটে ব্লিডিং টেন্ডেন্সি বেশি সেই ক্ষেত্রে ইভেন আফটার কন্টিনিউশন অফ দ্য ট্রিপল থেরাপি ফর ওয়ান মান্থ ইউ ক্যান সুইচ টু ডুয়াল থেরাপি লাইক ক্লোপিডোফিল এন্ড ওরাল অ্যান্টিবডি বাট হায়ার ইফ پیشنট এজ ইজ লেস দ্যান 65 দেন অ্যাসপিরিন এন্ড পি টু আইড ওয়েল টু নিউ টু মেবি প্রেসক্রাইব উইথ দ্য চার্জস ফর ইজ अराउंड জিরো এন্ড ডিউরেশন अगेन আপ টু 12 মান্থস এন্ড আফটার দ্যাট আইদার অ্যাসপিরিন অর পি টু আইড ওয়েল because the patient risk is thrombotic risk is less. Yeah, at the assessment of the ischemic and bleeding rates, usually child has health and has bleed score has to be calculated and balanced. Keep the triple therapy duration as short as possible. Dual therapy only may be considered in selected cases. Consider a target INR as low as possible, 2 to 2.5 when warfarin is used. Clopidogrel is the P2Y12 inhibitor of the choice. Use low dose for the aspirin as well as possible. As I have told, the 30 to 50 milligram is sufficient enough to produce full blockage of thrombocytic production. So, not more than 100 milligrams should be prescribed to this patient because it produces dose-dependent bleeding manifestation. PPI should be used in patients with history of GI bleeding, or as a reasonable to use in patients with increased risk of GI bleeding. European Society of Cardiology recommend routine use, but the American Society of Cardiology does not recommend uh, routine use, rather when it is in uh, And somewhere, in some part of the treatment period, patient may need to switch from one antiplatelet to another antiplatelet either due to genuine indication or due to financial constraint. So everybody have to know how to switch the antiplatelet as end from one to another. You see here, the acute setting, always reload, always reload, always reload. If the patient is on clopidogrel and you are going to prescribe the patient prasugrel, then irrespective of the prior clopidogrel timing and dosing, you can if the patient has pharmaceutical loading goes and then follow the maintenance. It's an acute setting. And again, if you go from clopidogrel to ticagrel, then again you have to give the loading goes and follow the maintenance, irrespective of duration of the administration of the clopidogrel. But on the contrary, if you go from ticagrel to clopidogrel, then it should be prescribed 24 hours after the last ticagrel dose. You start with the loading dose and then maintenance. And similarly, again, prosopylar ketro, acrobyl. 24 hours after the, after the last dose of the prosopylar, you just start with the loading dose and then give the maintenance. And from ticagrelor to prosopylar, eh, or from prosopylar to ticagrelor, they should be tested 24 hours after the last prosopylar. In chronic setting, a bit different. Important chronic setting when you switch from clopidogrel to prosopidogrel, then 24 hours after the last dose of the clopidogrel, you will go for directly in maintenance. And like ticagrel, like prosopidogrel, after 24 hours of the last dose of the clopidogrel, you will go directly with the maintenance. And in between ticagrel to prosopidogrel, 24 hours after the last dose, here yeah, there is no loading dose indicated in chronic phases. This is called intensification strategies when clopidogrel take a number of prosopidogrel by ticagrelor is able. I won't go for a number of ticagrelor and prosopidogrel take a clopidogrel is able. Should I come over to de-escalation study? This is the difference between the recommendation made by ACC AHA and the ESC upgrades. I'm not going in details here. Thank you very much. All they have taken a long time because these are very important issues. I could not control my uh, thank you, Excellent. Excellent presentation. I think when you start the uh, today's 
talk. Uh, I think uh, most of the fellows or faculties think about it, the topics is the easy topics, um, indication of endoplasty or drug procedure follow up. We know everything, but after well, you finishing the lecture, we finish the we we are have to know most of thing regarding the drug management follow up also preparation. Thank you, Kalik Bhai. It well prepared lecture. Thank you. I always uh, when I think uh, a speaker, I always think about you. Thank you, Khalik Bhai. Thank you, your well prepared lecture. Uh, uh, Professor Wadud, sir, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. Khalik, uh, it was a very nice and uh, very thoughtful lecture. Uh, one thing I should add, I should ask all the fellows before doing any procedure, please go through the papers of the patient yourself. Look at the hemoglobin level, look at the blood count, look at the creatinine, look at the potassium. Ask for the recent blood sugar, whether it is too low or too high. And look at the ECG, uh, whether the patient have new changes or the patient is a very stable one, as you have seen before. before. And these are things that will help you to avoid many problems. And during the procedure, after the procedure follow-up, so many things has been already discussed. And uh, it's a, be, become a bit difficult to remember all those things, but these lectures will be uh, in your, uh, you can get it always from the YouTube. So you can always go through them and refresh your memories. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Khalid Jaman, uh, Dr. Khalid Mozin, sir, please uh, comment. Hello. Yeah, yes. thank, you. thank you, Khalikud Jaman, for a very nice and very elaborate lecture. We have learned uh, some new things from your lecture, as usual. So I am really uh, uh, just uh, very happy to uh, find your lecture very informative and very practical. So I just uh, have a few comments regarding your lecture. No question from my part. Uh, regarding your uh, uh, balloon, yeah, I think uh, there is some uh, mention should be made about the drug eluting balloon. Uh, this is a definitely a, a situation when we cannot place a stent uh, because we know that uh, we don't have uh, very many options to stent a small caliber vessel or in a difficult anatomy when there is a osteal dystenosis after the stenting. So in that situation, we can uh, consider a drug eluting balloon. So this is uh, definitely a good addition to our armamentarium. And regarding the cutting balloon, we have to be very cautious about the inflation and deflation because sudden inflation and deflation, they take time to inflate and they take time to deflate. So we have to be very careful about it regarding the cutting balloon. And regarding the on-site surgical facility for, uh, uh, for to perform a PCI, uh, in, uh, in Dhaka city or the major metropolitan city, it is definitely available. But in many places where the PCI is done, but there is many centers, they don't have an on-site uh, uh, surgical facility. So it is really a limitation in our country, but it should not hinder or discourage our uh, young uh, interventionalist. So you have to properly select the case and uh, and you just be wary of the complications. So don't attempt very many risky cases in a center where there is a no surgical facility. And uh, Kaleko Jaman has mentioned uh, regarding the preparation, a good night sleep before the procedure. Right? It's not very clear the good night sleep for the patient or for the operator. Uh, so you, <laughs> we have to have a clear uh, explanation of the procedure. So the operator, sometimes they are working late at night, they finish their chamber and, and start. They don't have a good night's sleep uh, very many times. So I want a clear from you. And another thing, after transfer of the patient from the cath lab to the CCU, the patients are being cured by very junior level doctors and they don't have an idea uh, what uh, has been done in the cath lab. 
So it is, we have to be very careful and very wary of this situation. And some of us who, we don't, who don't do institutional practice, they do a rapid exchange after finishing the procedure. They change their cloth and rush to the OPD in another center. So the, it is a very precarious situation and we have to be very... Uh, in Dhaka city, most of the operators, they practice in the same center, but uh, many places the operators, they for another center. So, and regarding the monitoring uh, after PCI, I think uh, the, we should check for the urinary retention in the femoral route, it is quite common, and echocardiogram. And in some cases, the terminal, per, the distal vessel perforation, they don't manifest uh, very many times in the cath lab, but they uh, present with uh, pericardial tamponade in the ward. So uh, the looking for an echocardiogram uh, in the ward is very important if, uh, if there is slightest doubt in the mind. So thank you, Khaleko Jaman. So uh, I want uh, more lectures like in future. And thanks to the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Khaleko uh, Sir. We'll go to the, our, our budding cardiologist, that is fellows. Dr. Chawan Shinya, do you hear me? Uh, Mosif, can I start yeah. the question about a vital question? Yes, yes. Dr. Chawan, you ready for that? Then uh, what is that? Yes. One, so, sir? Yes, one, sir. We are advising we can discharge the patient even after six hours, but we should remember something. Always tailor the advices according to the situation prevailing in your sense in your country. Just uh, uh, remember that in Western country, if the patient have any problem, any bleeding or any problem, he can ask 911 uh, uh, nine and the ambulance will be there within 10 minutes. Is it possible in this country? No. So he advised regarding that should be tailored according to our status. In our country, the patient is at least after 24 hours or 48 hours because they cannot come back that easily. Yeah, thank you, sir. Because our hospital charge also so much less than the European country. Of only 3,000 taka or 4,000 taka. So it should be stay in the hospital. But in the European countries, it's more expensive. So ESC guideline, ACC guideline at the uh, repeat discharge from the hospital because insurance coverage is also there. Thank you, sir. Dr. Chawan Shinya, do you add something? Dr. Chawan Shinya, ask the question. Yes, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Khalid, sir, for your nice presentation. Sir, I have a very simple question. Is it necessary to withhold the metformin in a normal renal function patient before the procedure? Number one question, sir. And, uh, uh, and I, uh, I have a request that uh, everybody we should do an echo after the procedure. Uh, just Khalid Mohsen, sir, has told this uh, that we should do. Because we have a bitter experience in some patients that uh, perforation followed by uh, some mishaps uh, occurred sometimes. Uh, thank you. Khalid Mohsen, sir, do you need the uh, all patient stop the metformin? Khalid Mohsen. Khalid Mohsen, do you hear me? Are you with us? I think he's out of net. Uh, Professor Abdul sir. Do you hear me, sir? Yes. Uh, do you need the stop metformin in every case, sir? Sorry? No. Sir. No, first of all, I must uh, greatly acknowledge the contribution of the IPDI, especially for the fellows. Number two, the speaker was really good and he covered everything every corner of the uh, aspect of the PCAT evaluations. And it is really honored for me to uh, inviting me to join this webinar. And I have seen the Professor Subhera also. Uh, so, sir, what the my is the metformin stop in every cases, sir? You practice stop metformin in every cases? Not really, I, uh, I do not stop it, metformin, but it is better to stop it if you want to do it um uh, complex procedure like that but most of the time i keep it like that but uh, changing the all the time changing the metformin to the insulin converted to insulin um i did not follow in my clinical practice but if it is could be if it is very complex or complicated pci then it is better and is, especially if it is patient have a renal failure then we should change it. but ideally if it is possible it is better to change that uh, thank uh, you, may, I, may i add may i add something yes, 
Yes, yes. Yes, sir. They actually, what normally, metformin ideally we stop it. It's not that patient will develop any lactic acidosis or anything. But uh, if it is uh, customary to stop before any elective procedure. But if it is an emergency like primary or something, then you don't have time to stop it and do the things. You carry on with the procedures. So it's better even elective case to stop and cover with a uh, short acting insulin. But for emergency procedures, you don't have to worry. Alikha, do you have any input on that? Alikha, John, right? I think the network is a problem, Alikha. Dr. Shweb Ahmed from Stilet, do you hear me? Dr. Shweb? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, please uh, ask me a question. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to give the thanks to uh, sir, for your uh, elaborate and brilliant presentation, and uh, it's, it will work for all of uh, us. And also thanks to Wadu sir, Mohsin sir. Uh, so many questions to ask, but uh, I you use, please? Uh, one thing, sir, uh, it's very important to uh, remove the removal of sheet. What complication happen? Uh, removal of sheet. What precaution should be? Uh, 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 should be uh, keep in mind to remove of sheet, especially when uh, both uh, arterial and venous uh, sheet uh, 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 is there. Yeah, this is the first question. Uh, in previous class, we discussed detail in the sheet, but Professor Aung Kumar Chaudhary, do you hear me? Amulta. So, Professor Aung Kumar his question, what should you need remove of the sheet? Humoral or uh, um, uh, arterial venous sheet. Thank you, Professor Abdul Chaudhary and Mohsin Ahmed for inviting me as a panelist. Uh, I like to emphasize in my institute the loading dose from Tesla to COVID. What Khalifa Jamal already said that it should be very much meticulous and very much. Uh, familiar to every junior doctors and fellows, uh, what loading those, how to shift from high potency anti platelet to low potency anti platelet, low potency to high potency anti platelet. Every fellow should be because in NACP I shows when I told that uh, the article will be the loading dose that they miss they create a message situation. Possible will be the loading dose. They cannot shift cheat from property mail aspirin to uh, possible and uh, aspirin and ticker and aspirin. It is uh, in Khalifa German point, uh, he, he very nicely showed that the how to shift from the low potency to high potency and even the High potency to high potency, there is some dilemma. Every effect is basic things. Thank you, thank you very much, Kaliko Jaman and uh, IPDI for inviting me for nice uh, gathering, for nice presentation. Thank you. This is my comment about the uh, only one thing every person should know the loading goals, how to give the loading goals, and how to shift from one to another in loading zone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Subhi, Madam, do you hear me, Madam? Professor Subhi Rahman, do you hear me, madam? Madam is talking in the other phone, please. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Kaiser Rasulullah, Kaiser Bhai. Uh, Dr. Kaiser Rasulullah Khan, uh, he's a, uh, Dr. Shoaib asked one question. What precaution should you do for sheet removal, venous sheet or arterial sheet? Please point out this answer. Yeah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and uh, good evening to all. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Alekut Jaman for a nice presentation and it was very vivid and very descriptive and very important topic as well. Um, and secondly, has to do IPDA for this cat lab manual series. Now to take the Shoaib's question, to remove shit, which shit should be removed first? I usually try to remove the arterial shit first because if there is a venous shit, if there is any problem, you can give uh, saline or atropine if there is vasovagal. So first arterial shift, and then when the arterial shift is well stabilized, there is no bleeding, and you cough the tell the patient to cough, and there is no sprouting of blood and it's well stopped. Then I pull off the uh, venous shift usually. 
थैंक यू थैंक यू शोएब नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन डॉक्टर शोएब कैन आई ऐड समथिंग यस और और दिस यू सेड समथिंग या प्लीज शुड दैट द पर्सन हु इज डूइंग द शीट रिमूवल tell him to look at the monitor just remember what is the pass rate of the patient and the oxygen saturation and while removing this if the pass rate was 90 or 84 now it is becoming 72 the patient is going into vesicular shock because we were putting so much pressure in there with the removal process in particularly in the femoral is quite painful so the heart rate should be more If it is going down, if it it is not in the bradycardia stage, you can rest assured the patient is going to vessel vessel later. You should start fluid, and tell somebody get an electrode, and you can overcome the flow. The patient enters a critical stage. That one thing, and please use analgesic properly. Twenty-five milligram pethidine IV is very helpful, and use one person in looking in there. so these things these simple things help to prevent different complications thank you sir dr shweb could you another question dr shweb thank you sir sir uh, what kind of uh, uh, complication or events can occur during peripheral uh, time or uh, before discharge or immediately after discharge uh, commonly happen and what uh, precaution uh, should uh, we have to do common complication during uh, peripheral or angioplasty or before discharge uh, or after immediately after discharge uh, professor dr uh, sajiroman professor look dr sajiroman do you hear me yeah common complications in cath lab yeah should should be kept <laughs> mind for the fellows should be kept yeah, in mind you say you say it's a question like uh, throwing a stone in the sea because there are lots of complications and lots of, and in from different directions so it's really hard to say that which complications actually you are going to point out the problem is that that whatever the pre, pre procedural or the post procedural complications whatever it is because today's topics is much more like uh, the a little bit uh, for me like the half of the cooking because this topics is like the topics of angioplasty so angioplasty itself is not enough to end the procedure like this nowadays so it's like but but dr khalid jamar has just been a very good master chef just all the minutes of the cooking uh, i think the half of the cooking because angioplasty means by a drug coated balloon in the side branch when you can't you are not going to go for a, a, a stenting for the side branch or for small vessel even with a dry, even with a not by a plain ballooning is not recommended nowadays because of that proposal closure and peri procedural complications if you tell about the the uh, we coincide with these topics then angioplasty itself has got complications because it may cause dissections it may cause uh, intimal flaps the slow flow no reflow during the procedure so you need to uh, rush to go for the stenting to complete the pci not the angioplasty itself and after procedure whatever you have and whatever the complications you have i want to say to my residents and the fellows all the time that which dr khalgu jaman has already told but i want to say like professor sgm choudhury 1 2 3 4 that's four <laughs> things remember to prevent the complications after procedure and during procedure to keep me alert about four things the ejection fraction the serum creatinine the hemoglobin percentage and the potassium these four things first nothing else i don't want anything else i want this four, four things at once and every time when i will do the procedure because if you have more creatinine is a high creatinine then this point will will just knock my tympanic membrane all the time that i shouldn't give too much contrast if you have low hemoglobin percentage all the time try to do it that so that not too much spilling of the blood while doing the not to make the procedure messy 
and and for potassium if you don't correct it before procedure then everything will be very much complicated all on a sudden even when if the procedure and the operator himself is very very much well skilled also so this i can tell because which way i will tell the complication it will be a seven days lecture thank you thank, thank you. you we have there lots of discussion मिसिंग श्रीरामेशन <laughs> रेडियल uh, इलेक्ट्रोलो on the side of the uh, operator so that when you inside the cath lab you can see it and that's most important and that this is very important another thing is regarding the uh, regarding the discharge i think so you can discharge the patient later on second day but customarily we keep the patient on the second day and we discharge the patient on the third day there shouldn't be any problem and also some question is coming up that uh, whether we give the um, third day sram creatinine in all the patient no this is not true that if the patient is normal creatinine patient is not elderly patient is not um, then we should not uh, do all the time that we have to do the serum creatinine all the all, all all the time it is not necessary but if the patient having a high risk for ckd or patient is in ckd then definitely we can we have to do the serum creatinine on a third day and the seventh day also thank you i think so thank you sir uh, dr samia do you hear me dr samia tasmin yes please uh, unmute yourself okay yes thank you sir for giving me the opportunity for asking question uh the presentation was excellent actually but i have two question regarding particular situation to particular situation i mean if the patient is pregnant like the in change of pay medication first pay procedural medication and need if the inr is high i mean if a patient has barbed placement and the inr is above 2 and the patient need uh, urgent angioplasty i mean primary pci so what should we do then to reduce the risk of bleeding uh, professor sukhya madam do you hear me madam professor sukhya madam i can hear take, you now there's a problem take, there yeah, i can hear you so yes thank you lady thank you lady these questions again uh, please thank you lady uh with the uh, pre medication before procedure take the lady what precaution should be done pregnancy uh, and and pci or any primary pci what precaution pregnancy what? and pci yeah pregnancy and primary pci right pregnancy and primary pci yeah yeah <laughs> what precaution should be done have you seen yeah. one i have not seen one yet <laughs> Have you seen a theoretical question? Well, madam, I have seen. Madam, I have seen one seven days back. Well, you have seen one. I have not seen one. I am. I am just confused. 
<laughs> I have seen a lot of pregnant patients with mitral valvular disease had to do the PTMC urgent. That I have done, but not primary PCI. Yeah, I have yeah. not done any primary PCI the, uh, uh, pregnant, and I haven't received any MI with the pregnancy. Anyway, the question if it is theoretical, the um, theoretical that the uh, med pre medication, you uh, know, as we avoid, we, uh, we don't give any beta blockers, so nothing to worry about. We can you can give sedation, you can uh, anticoagulants. You have to use it because if it is, it is PCI, but again you have to monitor it very closely. And if there is any uh, complication, you have to before you have to explain to the patient and patient uh, next to kin that this thing can happen. You can lose the baby or you can have a severe bleeding. And if this thing happens, the gynecologist should be consulted and that should be ready in hand so that if there is any complication, we can always refer to the gynecologist and that then things can uh, can be sorted out. That should be the uh, normal way. So that you don't, uh, you know, you here the proportion is saving the patient's life, but baby's life is will be optional there. If there is any complication, then you have to sacrifice, you have to explain to the patient's uh, party and if uh, everything goes well, it's a home and drive for everybody. What Thank was you. the second question? Uh, I had around two, I think so, Samia. Yeah. Yes, if yeah. the patient already has valvular placement, as we have lots of chronic rheumatic heart disease patients who have already valvular placement, and patient um, needs primary PCI. So, what will be the precaution for this patient? So again, um, a patient with rheumatic heart disease. INR2. Well, if we, uh, INR2 is quite safe enough to do it, you have to, you know, in that case, heparin, you have to use really carefully if you have to give it. And uh, because I, uh, warfarin, you can always um, give uh, vitamin K1 to reverse it, and you can give the uh, heparin uh, as you need. So that, can, that is, as long as you know that you can use it, no problem. Uh, can I add something? Yes sir. yes, sir. One thing is that regarding INR and uh, primary PCI need, probably Calcutron have already described it. Uh, you have to use heparin at the lower dose, but and it's very, uh, quite high. You don't use heparin at all. Exactly. Number one. Well, may I add something? Yeah. Actually, yes. In a patient with a prosthetic valve, okay. it's better to use fresh frozen plasma. Rather than use in K, yeah. because it can predispose to valve thrombosis. So we have to keep that in mind. If the fresh frozen plasma is at hand, it is the preferable drug. If you it's available, it's very difficult to get the fresh frozen plasma. You know, but everywhere available. But madam, when it should be the it should be yeah, preferred. Yeah, true. If it is available, it's oh, the best. Yes, no sir. doubt. For it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, something. It's actually generally the route. If you choose the radial over the humor. Why, why don't you use the radial route? Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Radial route is the best one because now current recommendation is, if you look at all guidelines, class yeah. one is radial radial. in both yes. uh, ESC yeah. and ACC. So if you use radial, that should not be a problem. Thank you. Thank you. And the INR is two to three. Then only continuation of the work thing is enough. Can I add one thing there? If you yeah. if you are uh, scanning the patient uh, for the sake of the baby, you can use the lead uh, also for uh, in the back of the patient yeah, so that the mm -hmm. radiation to the baby is. Safe. Yeah, ma yeah, yeah madam, that, that, I, that I have done, that I am going to tell. Yeah, that's that's it. Right. Now, without, without giving too much pressure because the yeah. lead itself has got to wait. So yeah. you have to put some support over there yeah. so that the, it's not over the belly, it's not going to push that exactly, much. Exactly, yeah. That's and what also, we do in the PTMC. And the, yeah, and that also the most important thing is that before doing that one, please contact with some very good uh, 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 obstetricians uh, to de-shoulder some of your responsibilities to her. That is also Thank very you. important. Thank you. Lots of questions. Uh, we can, uh, I, I do Galaxy A30. I think the, the name of the Galaxy A30. Dr. Do you hear me? You write down Galaxy A30. 
You raise your hand. I don't know his name. Device name. Device name. But please, please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Mohsin, he may be artificial intelligence. Uh, please unmute yourself. Mohsin. Okay. Please ask a question. Ask a question, please. Can I add something regarding the previous question? Yes, sir. Pregnant women can be given unfractionated hepatitis C. So, primary PCI, the worry something is what about the aspirin we can use? We can use the unfractionated heparin. What about the other P2Y12 inhibitors? That's the problem. That I answer. think current recommendation yes, 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 are not there. In I mean, if you are in the transradial approach, then you you don't need to worry that much. You will go on with your. After the procedure, we have to continue DAPT. Yeah, of course yeah. you will continue. Yeah. Oh. I think this so far the study with Tigreglid is yeah. not confirmed in pregnant patient. Yes. I think it's still uh, clopidogrel is on the market for a long time. It will be so safer to use clopidogrel instead of Tigreglid yeah. or Prasuril because for any uh, nothing is safe hundred percent. But yeah. if you have to use. But, uh, Better to use the clubby dog in this situation. Pressing girl should not be. Should not. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next question. Yeah. Galaxy yeah. Party. Uh, please ask a question. Very important. Okay, next question. Doctor, uh, doctor, please ask a question. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, please ask. Your name, your name, please. I am Doctor Shiraj. Yeah, please. From Select. Please ask your question. How how frequently should follow up the patient after angioplasty? How frequently follow up the patient? Do you have a question? How frequently should follow up the patient? I, I think Kalikajuban uh, Bhai always a network problem in their center. Yeah, Professor Wadu, sir, please. How frequently? How frequently. Uh, there is no specific protocol how frequently it should be followed up. It depends on the clinical status of the patient, number one. Number two, very procedural events, whether there are any procedural events or not. Number three, in which setting the ECI has been performed. If the patient is clinical status is stable, there is no very procedural complication, then the follow-up may be done at the longer interval. Hello. Hello. Yeah, can hear you. Yeah. with mobile hot that would be better. Dr. Keshop, do you hear me? Dr. Kashyap from Nepal, please ask your question. Yes, Dr. Kashyap. We cannot hear you, Kashyap. Yeah. We cannot hear you. That's all right. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Hello? Ask me. Ask Hello? Question. Hello? Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yes. Clear. You can ask your question. Yes, in yes, so sometimes we do get uh, patients with uh, who gives the previous history of uh, aspirin hypersensitivity. So if the patients, if such patients presents in emergency with acute STEMI, and in such cases, how to approach, sir? Whether to give loading dose aspirin, how to give uh, aspirin as a loading dose, sir? Uh, Khalik bhai, it is the most important question. Not not sensitivity. Sometimes the GI irritation. We should give the aspirin or single dose clopidogrel. Dr. Khalipa Jawan, please unmute yourself. Unmute. Khalipa Jawan, unmute. There is two issues. One is hypersensitivity or allergy, and one are, one, another one is GIT intolerance. I think this yeah. two issue is very important in terms of aspirin administration. When the patient has got definite history of aspirin that induces bronchospasm, who is and like that, in those cases, as the aspirin is very essential and uh, main part of the treatment of the antiplatelet therapy, aspirin can be given in a desensitization way. First, start with a very low dose of the aspirin, then gradually increase the dose and reach the target loading dose within a few hours. This is called as aspirin desensitization method. 
that that is uh, that can be achieved within a few hours and second is aspirin intolerance gid uh, the aspirin is very vital drug so it can be prescribed with the coverage of the uh, definitely with the uh, ace to blocker or with the omeprazole or proton any of the proton pump inhibitor although the Omeprazole has got drug interaction with the clopidogrel, but it is not very much clinically apparent. Number one, number two, in those cases we can add pantoprazole or rebiprazole, rather than isoprazole or omeprazole. Pantoprazole is a good choice. So we can cover those patients with GIT intolerance with aspirin with H2 blocker, notably famotidine, or with pantoprazole, or in aspirin sensitive cases, aspirin desensitization method. We can add aspirin. But we have to accommodate aspirin those patients, in those patients in the very early phase of the treatment. But later on, when the duration of the GAPT is over more than 12 months, then single antiplatelet agent without aspirin, we can continue. Either clopidogrel or anyone. But up to 12 months, aspirin should have the patient. So in those cases, to start with loading those, aspirin desensitization method is a way to administer to avoid or to mitigate the effects of the allergic reaction by the aspirin. At the same time, other anti-allergic medication should be instituted to reduce the severity of the sensitization induced by the aspirin. Excellent answer. Uh, Dr. Tanvi Raman, do you hear me? Dr. Yes, Tanvi Yes, who do you question? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you to Falgo Jama, sir, for the nice presentation. Actually, I had a similar sort of question and a similar experience. I had a patient who had severe uh, hypersensitivity with SPD and presented with antiseptic MI. We had to do primary PCI in proximal LED. So we are in a dilemma which two antiplatelets we are going to use. So we use Picarel and uh, as an alternative, we added Silastrozole, but I'm not sure whether is supported in any paper, papers or not. So I just want to get your views in uh, patients who are having hypersensitivity with aspirin, if dual antiplatelets are required, what can be the option? Secondly, sir, in COVID era, patients who are on dual antiplatelet having recent uh, history of uh, procedure of PTCA, uh, when anticoagulation is required, when anticoagulation is required, we were observant for longer duration of period. What strategy of antiplatelet would you like to follow? Uh, Professor Dr. Mohan Jawan, sir, do you hear me? Sir, Mohan Jawan, sir. Professor Mohan Jawan, sir. Yes. Sir, regarding aspirin, sir, it is the uh, most important drug for the PCI. Plus, sometimes we saw the some uh, chest physician stop the aspirin and they continue the COVID role. And uh, Dr. Uh, in the case, yes. what's your experience about the screen? The screen is most important. Thank you. Thank more you. More different than the screen. Uh, yes. uh, thank yes. you. The, I, I really appreciate IPDI and also the today's speaker, Kaliku uh, Really, it's a brilliant and excellent, very vivid. Although he must be tired of talking a long, long, as a three lecture in one a lecture, but still is a very informative. Thank you very much once again. And uh, before giving the answer of uh, your question, I want to just give some comment about his lecture. Uh, regarding the informed consent, actually we rarely inform the patient in thoroughly. That's why the patient uh, and patient attended misbehave with the doctor because the, the risk benefit was not been explained properly. And especially if you do ad hoc cases, you don't have much time only hardly patient is on the table, hardly we are talking about say, five, 10 minutes. And if anything happens, the patient will not take it easily. There is the reason there is a lot of uh, mishap happen between the patient attendant and the uh, doctor. Uh, regarding post-procedure uh, care, uh, everybody says, and also Kaligujama also mentioned, uh, I think Always honor the patient complaint. Don't ignore the patient complaint. Physically, uh, see the puncture site. 
and this too is enough. If you just casually uh, seeing the patient, you may miss that there is a huge hematoma going on, and at the time the, he will need blood transfusion. It is simply shame because if the patient is in post procedure acute care place, why he need uh, so much time to identify that he need blood transfusion? So this is very important for the uh, patient who uh, are on duty, uh, the doctor who are on duty. And regarding the discharge, then also they need counseling uh, regarding the medication, regarding the diet, regarding the activity. Problem is that uh, we hear uh, it's a, intervention is a, is a teamwork, but problem is that the team leader is the only one who is responsible for everything. The good thing, bad thing, everything. So I think uh, the, the operator has got two, three fellows with him working. Either, uh, 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 they can be given a different task as a job description. Somebody will look after reprocedure, somebody will look after pre-procedure, post-procedure, and somebody should look after the parameters during procedure. So that there will be no miss. Like, uh, and I also said that there, is, uh, there should be a board. In my hospital, we practice different way, definitely other hospital where uh, uh, a lot of consultants coming and going, doing their case, going out. So there is the problem. If somebody in the cath lab, fixed doctor, <coughs> fixed doctor, not attached with anybody, he can actually take care of uh, all these things together. And uh, regarding the uh, my practice in, in, in my uh, early part of my training, what I used to do, I, before going to the procedure, I see the angiogram and I plan what I will do and write it down and keep it in my pocket. What wire I will take, what balloon I'll take, what stent I'll take, what guiding catheter I'll take, which should. So I keep it in the pocket. And after finishing, I compare these two things to what actually the operator did and what I have planned. In that way, I can measure that what level I reach to start myself. I think this is for the fellow, my request do this practice. When you see that you are very close to your mentor, then it is definitely you will not be in trouble. Now come to the question of your uh, uh, aspirin related. Uh, uh, Kalikozama said two things. One is the hypersensitivity. Other one is the uh, intolerance. One more thing is the resistance. These three things is as they're related with the aspirin. We have a lot of uh, uh, work on it. Uh, Tanvir said one issue, the patient is known hypersensitive and he used silastazole. As per guideline says, silastazole, although it is antiplatelet, uh, and, and sometimes it is a triple antiplatelet therapy, silastazole uh, in some studies, uh, uh, observational studies, he used in complex lesion angioplasty, multiple stains, means as a whole complex lesion. And I also practice in some part of my uh, practice, I used to use triple antiplatelet therapy, including aspirin, uh, in a very high risk patient. But patient is uh, known hypersensitive. Uh, I cannot give aspirin. That actually didn't happen to me. Uh, I think the first 10, 15 days or up to one month is the highest period of stain thrombosis. So in that case, uh, alternate to aspirin, yes, you can use a, another antiplatelet like silastazole. That is one option. If you cannot give, otherwise the calculator one said the, the, the desensitization, this is another option. If even then he cannot tolerate aspirin, then you can have to add one more antiplatelet, as said, dual antiplatelet. So in that case, I think silastazole is one of the options which has got antiplatelet activities. 
and that is most essential in the early part of uh, intervention like first month after that you can switch to let's say uh, some other uh, more stronger antiplatelet like ticagrelor compared to as uh, clopidogrel but first one month i think it's preferable to use aspirin if not yes you can use still still to them that i can say from my small knowledge thank, thank you, you very much once again uh, you. Uh, second question uh, 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 use the antiquagulants antiquagulants can i think actually there has been some studies where we uh, the patient has a indication for anticoagulation and in that case they have done the procedure given aspirin just loading dose and that's the only single dose of aspirin they have given but they continue with clopidogrel and the full dose of anticoagulation one some studies have been done in stays in the hospital for 24 or 48 hours they have used aspirin for only days two days but discharge the patient with only single antiplatelet preferably clopidogrel in some studies with ticagrelor but never prasugrel with full dose anticoagulation and continue it for up to one year then continue stop the antiplatelet together uh, all together and continue the anticoagulation totally and regarding the aspirin hypersensitivity actually i have done patients who have aspirin sensitivity in those cases you can prepare the patient if you got the time with uh, 72 hours before with antihistamine and steroid do the procedure loading dose and etc then uh, you can shift to a potent antiplatelet and use this aspirin alternate day or at a lower dose or as uh, momijan bhai has said use silostrazol but we do not have data regarding that i haven't seen any yeah so can i add something madam please Yeah, the, the patient, if you know from the beginning um, that uh, is a very hypersensitive, so you, sh you should those cases you should use this uh, latest trends, which says that you can use antiplatelets yeah. for two weeks or so. So the, you use those trends. Number one, number two is that for two weeks you can use the anaxaparin for uh, giving the patient. that so that uh, the patient doesn't have any problem i don't know whether there is any study done i'm not up to date sorry about that rivaroxan can be given as well there was some study before um, that that can be given instead of aspirin along with the uh, right way is to give with the aspirin rivaroxan but rivaroxan can be given along with the clopidogrel that can be given for yeah. another two weeks that the acute that, coronary syndrome there is an indication yeah, yeah. right Yeah, yes. so these these can be milligram, first two weeks to this. be on the safe side give a low molecular weight heparin and then after two weeks yeah, you over, overlap with the rivaroxan uh, along with the clopidogrel i had some patients like this uh, three or four patients and i i have done uh, them and i have followed up we, uh, re frequently because there is no choice there these are special patient it comes one in few thousand probably but uh, another thing is follow up with um, i agree with uh, all my um, the colleagues here and my ex students also the the what do we do mumin uh, jamal uh, has rightly said uh, uh, every hospital has got their own way of follow up and they, but universally what we i have learned and i have been taught that we, so we give any patient without complication whatever we are giving for the uh, pc post pci that should be checked either uh, after one week uh, the hematological consequence and then after one month see the patient along with the ecg and if needed echo but if not needed is no need for the echo then uh, you uh, change the treatment as per patient's uh, if symptom if there is any one more question was asked before If usually when when we started our cath lab was in one corner our ccu was on in one corner our echo room was in another floor it was a, me a mess uh, like that because we, we kept on adding but nowadays is usually ccu cath lab all this so is better if the ccu or post ccu or post cath is in non uh, in same floor one echo machine will do the job if not two machine 
So if they can afford one machine, that, that can be done. If there is any query, it can be used in CCU, it can be used in the cat lab if it is needed for to detect the complication. And one machine will do the job for CCU, post-CCU, post-cat. Uh, that's what I feel, and that I mean, nowadays it is possible, but when we uh, did in uh, uh, those olden days, that is different. That was not ideal, but we did that. And uh, I think there is a severely sensitive patient with the um, aspirin, sensitive patient must be like this. What we have done, the, I think, should be all right. But again, uh, we have to see the literature more and see what is uh, These are the uh, patient which comes uh, now and again, and we are really in problem. But GI tract protection, you have to give them also omeprazole or pentoprazole or even uh, the, uh, what is the other one, the latest one they're using. Anyone regularly you have to give, which we usually don't give more than two weeks. But you, for those patients, you have to use more than that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, madam. Dr. Ashish De, do you hear me? Dr. Ashish De from Chittagang. Ashish. Thank you, Mosin yes. and IPBI, and for, so yes. this, this for your valuable and also give me the opportunity for the panelists. Just uh, thank you, Khalegu John Bai, for uh, your vivid lecture. I also learned many things from here. Just I want to mention this, Sir Mohan John Sir also mentioned the post procedure during compliance, compliance of the patient, and what the <coughs> dual antiplater type, antiplater, especially newer ones. Uh, Prasugrel and Tigagola. Recently, in Chidang, one of our colleagues did a uh, PCI oil, they did CS10 and patient discharged with Tigagola. Two to three weeks after that, patient came with acute MI and cardiogenic shock and all the CS10 are blocked. Because patient goes to uh, Belize, that uh, Tigagol and uh, the shopkeeper and also <coughs> they used to buy the medicine, but and the, uh, but, but, but the shopkeeper did not know that ticker. They gave, probably, we suspect that uh, the Tegredol. So they show that this is a Tegredol, which is the anti convulsant drug. And patient did not take any ticker and also <coughs> develop stent thrombosis and ultimately patient died. So this is our main concern about the newer drugs, especially those people who are coming from the villages and illiterate. So during a discharge, we have to assure that this drug should not be a st stopped and it should be continued. And uh, if there is if there is any query, we should uh, switch over to the provider, which is available on uh, the uh, all the side of the country. And uh, so this is my comment. This is, this is the bitter experience that we have faced recently that I have shared. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Dr. Shomit Bajal, Dr. Shomit, do you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. I have one uh, simple question. Uh, as for the new guideline, uh, when a patient with, uh, uh, with acute coronary syndrome comes to us and uh, PCI is indicated, primary PCI is indicated, the guideline says that uh, the P2Y12 inhibitors should not be given until uh, the angiogram is seen. So let's say if we do not have prostogrel or ticagrelor and uh, we have to depend on clopidogrel only. And uh, as you know, if we give this drug uh, in a high dose at a dose of 600 mg, the effect comes in play only after two hours. In that case, uh, is it uh, preferable to use cangrelor as a bridging therapy or should it depend on uh, the action of clopidogrel that comes only after two hours? Uh, uh, Shami, my question is, why do you cannot give ticagrelor or prasugrel and you are thinking about cangrelor, the IV antiplatelet? We are not having gold or silver. Now we are thinking about gold and uh, diamond. Is it a justifiable question? I don't think so. Can the is for surgery, for not cardiac surgery, you have to stop a, a dual antiplatelet. Maybe you can continue aspirin. In that case, you use cantaloupe and stop it around two hours before the surgery. And that's it. It, it works uh, limited, very limited. But it only, has, only that case, yes. All in this situation, here, Ticagrelor, Prasugrel rules, and Clopidogrel is the reliable alternative. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Arif, Dr. Arif, do you hear me? Yes, sir. 
uh, any question left in the chat box? Yeah, the uh, huge question. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Alec Jones sir uh, for excellent lecture and covering all the ins and outs of this topic. So, uh, let's uh, ask him one question for the lecturer in Kodan, Nizamul Hussain from CMH. He asked, if a post-PCA patient suffers from dengue within one month of procedure, what should be the antipathetic management of that time? Dengue with uh, dual antipathetic. ट काउंट If it is more than one lakh, then you can prescribe dual, even dual and antiplatelet with any hesitations. But if it is below one lakh, that is above fifty thousand, then you can consider single antiplatelet drug. But if it is below fifty thousand, you should avoid the procedure. This is the recommendation. First, and uh, may I comment? Uh, Regarding the lecture, sure, sir. Short, short comments. Yes, a very short comment. Can I? I am at the late part of this oh, session. Yes, <laughs> My first comment is: Don't rush for puncturing the radial artery, as because I am a radialist. Before examining yourself, the radial and ulnar artery simultaneously. This is my first comment. Second, don't leave the hospital before examining the puncture site. to see any complications particularly when we encircle the wrist by leucoplast most of the cases there is a venous stasis and this leads to dorsum of the hand swelling and when duty doctor or nurse see the swelling they try to loosen the bandages and this gives to arterial hematoma this is a very important issue so usually what we practice we should just forking the dorsal end of this leucoplast to ensure the easy venous drainage so you can overcome this venous stasis number 1 number 2 you can slightly loosen the bandages just to relieve the pain second so third one this is a very common practice and very irrelevant practice and illegal practice i i i also say most of, almost all of the centers we practice anti uh, that is heparin low molecular weight heparin routinely in every patient patient just after putting a stent i think there is no recommendations for giving low molecular weight heparin 3 dose 6 dose or 8 dose in every patient patient this should be clear clarified to the uh, fellows and fourth is uh, i have seen many of the uh, faculties uh, practice clopidogrel or clopidogrel particularly 300 mg as a maintenance dose i think this is a black box warning we should not practice like this and lastly i must thanks kaliku jawan bhai for excellent presentation and Na, last but not the least the chairman and secretary of ipdi and all the admin, uh, admin of ipdi they are doing a very excellent job in the covid era so i must congratulate all of them thank you very much uh, thank you i think uh, arif lots of question because lots uh, uh, very also, uh, last uh, last question yeah arif there is one question asked by dr patho about the glycoprid to be three inhibitors I want to know the use uh, of glycoprid to be changed in, in case of PCI, and what will be the sheet removal strategies those who are getting a uh, GP to be changed. Excellent question, Dr. Kalika Jawan, bhai. Dr. Kalika Jawan, bhai. Uh, GP to be three inhibitor uh, in the treatment of acute coronary syndrome has almost uh, in an abundant phase because there is no strong indication for using GP to be three inhibitor in any acute setting. Or any routine coronary intervention setting, 
apart from few situation where there is procedural complication in the form of no reflow or slow flow. In those situation, you can add intercoronary GP2P3 inhibitor. Number one. <coughs> Number two is that if there is any during procedure, there are complications like that, slow flow, no reflow, or you are leaving some dissection which need to, need to cover with the stand, then you can give a long uh, 18 to 24 hours administration of gp 2 b inhibitor in intravenous form, controlled intravenous form. You can give 2 b 3 inhibitor in those complicated cases where right? there is no flow, slow flow or you are leaving some dissection which are need to cover it. And in those situations, sheath removal strategy will be a bit different from normal uncomplicated disease, right? That we stop, we reduce or we have the dose of the continuous infusion of the gp 2 b 3 inhibitor for 30 minutes and then we remove the sheath and after 30 minutes we reinstitute the, again the treatment of the gp 2 b 3 Continue for our desired period about 18 to 24 hours following the intervention. Uh, there is thank you, sir. For routine, it is rather downgraded to GP to the indication for using actually after using GP2B3 inhibitor, uh, the sheath removal also remember up in simple thing. CT must be less than one, uh, 150. That's it. So you have to stop it or reduce the dose, check the ACT. If it's below 150, remove the sheath. Then if you have to do the gp 2 a inhibitor, start it again. That's the procedure. Achha, regarding Asad Juman's observation, Asad is forgetting something. Something that, how can you ensure, have you seen the result of Plavix and the result of Pladix are the quality same? Do you think it is 22 karat gold or it is 18 karat gold? That's the problem. And in our country, so it is not a black box finding. Do not exaggerate. In our country, 40% patient, Barton's study have shown, has to have regular resistance. And some of them are totally resistant, some are partially responded. They need higher dose. So it's not black box warning. You should use your judgment. That's the most important thing. But not more than 150 milligram, I think so. Sir. More than 150 milligram. Nobody is using that more than 150 milligram. And yes, the question is, okay. we are Can I? to use things from balloon, taxi sheet, to catheter, everything. Are they okay. having potential for thrombogenicity or other complication? Or when we are using the newer, newer things, that's a problem. And these are the situation, use your discretion. Guidelines are there to guide you. Guidelines are not there to make you You can do that. Yes, sir. And guidelines... Can I ask a specific question, sir? Yes, uh, very yeah. Yes, a specific question, sir. Yes. Patient, uh, if patient, SES patient on TPM and uh, angioplasty done, how should this patient follow up? When should beta blocker add and when this patient should be discharged? If patient reverts back to sinus rhythm, patient due to ischemic region, patient on, yeah. on TPM and angioplasty done, this patient, how do this patient follow up after uh, angioplasty when patient is discharged? And when beta blocker will be added? It is the, uh, it is the most, uh, why, why did the TPM? First question, why patient needs the ischemic, TPM? Ischemic region, sir. Ischemic region. It is the anterior or inferior? Please. Uh, on brief, last last comments. I think uh, I think there is two issues here. One is uh, patient develops some sorts of radiarrhythmia with necessitates to implant the temporary Right. And patient has been done a PCI procedure. These two things here. Is it so, Shweb? Shweb, do you hear me? Tarik, but you explain. Uh, it is Hello. it is ischemic. A good a good injury, am I? Hello. A good injury, am I? 
It could, okay. it could include MI and entry of MCD. It could include MI and the patient has been reversed. Okay. Like a complete heart block. Yeah. At the same time, Schwab has got PPM in situ. Schwab and B. Dr. Schwab, you have... If the intervention has been taken in the acute setting and revascularization has been done, so it is hopeful so we are having you sir khaligun sir continue sir network disturbed sir abhi shunte the sir bolan sir khaligun sir number one is that we are hopeful we are hopeful the patient in the acute setting the revascularization has been done both in inferior and the anterior septic cases so we are hopeful the return will be returned and patient can be withdrawn from the tpm and we are able to start the beta blockers number two is that you have to follow up the patient. So long the rhythm does not return to normal sinus and patient remain in the same EPM dependent, you need to have a permanent pacemaker implantation, whatever the indication you have uh, the patient before doing the procedure. Because if inferior MI, if there is an necrosis to the AV node, you will not get the rhythm return. So you have to follow up the case. And we conventionally, we wait for 10 to 14 days, or at best 21 days, then we have to take decision if the rhythm does not come back to normal, or whatever the reason, either inferior MI or anterior MI, we have to put a power in this one. And in spite of waiting for 10, 14 days, if the rhythm returns to normal, gradually coming back, first degree, if it is coming to complete uh, heart block to second degree, then coming to first degree, if block, then sinus ready, and then ultimately sinus rhythm. So it, we gradually uh, win the TPM as individual institutional protocol or UTJ, and then you withdraw the TPM. And to institute the beta blockers, I think at the same setting, better not to start the beta blocker. Follow up the patient after one or two weeks, do the ICG, see the rhythm, and then accordingly start the beta blockers. Thank you, thank you. The last comment from the Dr. Fatima, madam. Lots and, of questions. And in anteroceptal sitting or anterior yes. sitting, I am very happy. Yes, sir. What is sir? Yes, sir. Clear cut contraindication is yes. a heart block. Why are you thinking about Peter Plucker then? Yes, sir. It's contraindicated. It's, it's contraindicated despite the patient having an MI. You should not use it. Yes, That's that. You use AC inhibitor, you use the statin, you use antiplatelet, you use revascularization. That's it. What is the is follow up the patient, go good rhythm, etc. You can think about beta blocker. Not yes, sir. My yes. question is yes, after yes. angioplasty, but revascularization is patient is reverse back to sinus rhythm. Then when we should start beta blocker? All right. It's yes. patient okay. will need a permanent pacemaker. Now, there is no definite protocol, but it's your judgment and it's your decision. When the rhythm becomes sinus and it becomes stable, let it give some time or few weeks to see the uh, nature of the rhythm of the patient, and then you think to add the beta blocker. Thank you. 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 Thank yeah, though there is no recommendation to use anaxaparin, there is no recommendation to use anaxaparin after PCI, but in our practice, we routinely give three doses of anaxaparin because in our, <laughs> during our initial period, there is lots of uh, stent thrombosis. Then uh, we do a uh, study with the anaxaparin and after using an anaxaparin, our Stent thrombus is reduced. After that, it's our routine practice to use uh, three doses of anaxaparin after PCI routinely. Though there is no recommendation, international uh, study recommendation to use the anaxaparin routinely. Uh, Professor Subhiyaman, madam, do you uh, need the need the anaxaparin after post PCI? Lots of questions there. Oh, yeah, there there is a couple. No, I think for the fellows, this is for fellows. Uh, yeah. What I'm trying to say that if usually if you are doing it primary PCI 
and then uh, you after the PCI, you can give a three dose or four dose for uh, means after two uh, two days, and after that they give give go in uh, dual platelets. That is one uh, group is uh, practicing. The other and uh, only for um, uh, if it is acute MI and uh, history within sort of a week or so. Uh, if you are doing that PCI, again, you can use it, but as there is no hard uh, guideline is there. When anoxaparin came in the market, we did some study in an ICBD about 100 patients, which we gave these uh, following PCI two days, and then before PCI, we gave that, but the study was uh, uh, okay. There was no complication or there was no, nothing to note from there. Another thing is that uh, regarding this uh, antiplatelet therapy, we must uh, the fellows should be clear about it. That once you have started any antiplatelet, dual platelet, if you want to switch over, you must make sure that you, with the proper dose you switch over and have uh, 24 hours overlap. Which uh, colleague Jaman has nicely, nicely presented. His presentation is excellent, and he has uh, two slides he has shown again and again. I think that is important for you. That it, something, if you don't know, please don't do it. And the follow-up of the patient is very important. You see, our fellows, we don't do these days. When I was a fellow, uh, we used to do 25 uh, cases of pressing in the groin. At that time, radial was not that popular at all. It was not there. So we, if you can do 25, then you know your complication, you know what to do, you know how much to do, what not to do. And that's why they used to, we used to feel very bad that time, but that has given us the guide till today. Even in the telephone, they say this has gone wrong, then we know what they have done. So this is for the fellows, they must attend, they must do pressing and then a hemostasis and they should, they should know what it is. Uh, 25 cases is not a big deal for the life, but if you do it, then you'll not. And now you are doing radial, please do the radial as well, as well as the femoral. Then you'll know where you are and what. Uh, we don't. We blame the juniors, but we have to teach them before blaming. Mm -hmm. Blaming. And I was not popular because of this, because I was meticulous about that. Who is pressing the groin? Who is doing that? There is no hematoma. So to avoid the complication we must uh, know what we are doing. Number two, I want to say that removing the, uh, the pacemaker thing that uh, dependent, if you have done PCI uh, and the patient is dependent on the temporary pacemaker, you wait as uh, Kaliko Jaman has already said, two weeks to three weeks. And if the patient come back uh, to normal rhythm, there's no need to do anything else. You follow them up about a month or so, then beta blocker can be small doses added to it if it is not inferior MI. That can be calcium channel blocker can be used in inferior MI. So if anterior MI or interceptal, whatever, in anterior side, you can use the beta blocker, but that is late, uh, later on. Removing the sheath, as uh, we, we know that if uh, you are doing uh, dependent on it, then arterial sheath should be removed and you leave the temporary pacemaker there and uh, wait for three weeks, good three weeks. And after that, still patient needs it, then you know that the patient will need a permanent pacemaker. So when you are going to do the permanent pacemaker, the question will come again, how long you will stop the dual antiplatelet? Thank you. Those cases, those cases, you have to do patient switch over to heparin and or you can do the pacemaker with a uh, diathermy so that the bleeding can be controlled and bleeding can be, can be um, sealed and uh, can be done nicely. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. We are passing. The presentation was excellent. And you uh, thank you to both of you, you and uh, Dr. Bodhut. Thank you for having me. I joined late, but thank you. Thank you, Madam. We are passing two and a half hour. Khaled Bosin, sir, last question. Last uh, uh, question. Uh, what hemoglobin level and what platelet count should be level in liver PCI? Hemoglobin level and platelet count. What level you uh, say for the say for the patients? Yeah. Actually, hemoglobin level per se does not matter much, but we all know that anemia is an independent cause of angina in a patient with uh, normal coronary artery. So we should avoid doing coronary angiogram in anemic patients. We have to evaluate this, them very properly. We have seen that a lot of patients with anemia are wrongly sub subjected to coronary angiogram. They are 
having the secondary type of angina. This is not the primary angina. So we, we should avoid this as a part of ethical practice. But the platelet count, it does matter. Uh, but uh, actually, in case of ischemic heart disease patient, it is, as per the guidelines, the hemoglobin should be more than 10 in, in yes. patient documented ischemic heart disease. And in patient with non-documented ischemic heart disease, without ischemic heart disease, the minimum level of hemoglobin should be 7 gram per deciliter. This is the hematological guidelines they say. So, so if we consider a patient with ischemic heart disease, the hemoglobin should be more than 10. And uh, if the patient is not documented ischemic heart disease, the hemoglobin level should be more than 7. And regarding the level of platelet count, actually the count, the quantitative and qualitative aspect of platelet should be judged, actually. So as Khalikud Jaman has already uh, described, Jaman has also said, uh, that uh, with the use of radial as, uh, angiogram and angioplasty, the bleeding risk has been minimized and the, we have become a bit more liberal in cases of doing uh, procedures in a lower platelet count. So it, 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 the, what the guidelines say, if the puncture area is easily compressible, we can uh, do the procedure safely with the 50,000 platelet. If the platelet, uh, the quantitative aspect of platelet is good. But if the you should not judge the only the qualitative and quantitative, the both things should be considered. And if we want to do a femoral procedure, we have to be very meticulous about the hemostasis. And in those cases, I think uh, the use of a closer device or a femostop uh, should be available uh, as a uh, I think a backup procedure. I think. So. Mausen, Mausen, Mausen. Thank you, Roman, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a, a little bit controversy there uh, yeah, concerning the hemoglobin level yeah. in PCI books and the, all the literatures and the studies are telling also the cutoff value is eight gram. The below eight, then you may need transfusion because blood transfusion itself for PCI patients is also is such a dilemma also because it may work both in for uh, it may aggravate the thrombosis, stent thrombosis or something or without giving it also a problem. But a cutoff value is eight gram. And for thrombocyte, for, because there are lots of uh, case studies and small observational right. studies with ITP with 50,000 50, or less than 50,000 platelet count. But if the, that patient has got a primary, needs a primary PSA, whether we'll have to do it or not, we'll have to do it. So, uh, yeah, but I am telling this. So I'm telling that, so, uh, that if you tell in that way. So I mean and, and that the platelet count is a is a factor, obviously, and 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 the colored is really uh, because there is some uh, there is some uh, corner side uh, uh, writings are there that yeah, fifty thousand is a cutoff value that up to fifty thousand, and for transradial approach, it's really fifty thousand or <laughs> even. Uh, as in and around 50,000 is safe for bleeding complications, exercise bleeding complications. Another thing is important, the thrombocytopenic con uh, condition, use of bifalbrudin is a very good option actually, though it is... But has it, by, it, is, it has been downgraded. <laughs> It has, it has a good less bleeding complication, I know, but the thing is that the 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 other factors of the bivalvulin yeah. is has got a less uh, implication yeah. on the PCI itself also. Yeah. But but maybe used in the uh, uh, sir, uh, just explain the ITP. ITP with uh, in case of ITP, that uh, count may be accepted around twenty thousand also. Hello. Yeah. What is what is in case of ITP? One thing. Yeah. yeah platelet count, be careful about using unfractionated heparin because patient may have HIV. Yeah. A hematologist say, please don't use that. Use If you need to use, use bivalurutin or use low, uh, low molecular heparin. I can yeah. Yeah, but that's our problem. In our country, Vadud uh, Bhai, IV enoxaparin is not given. But you know that even in the guidelines they are telling, if we use, uh, uh, if we use, I have if we use IV enoxaparin, then you use it during, during period. Oh, who is, who is uh, listening? 
Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Especially yeah, in the, in the presence of thrombocytopenia. Yeah. No problem is with not with anticoagulant, rather antiplatelets. Yes. Yes. We give full dose antiplatelets to the patient having thrombocytopenia. Yes. Continue DAPT. Yes. 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 That's why uh, the loma, that's why the regular heparin is uh, should not use in case of uh, thrombocytic purpura. Heparin yeah. itself yeah. having uh, platelet uh, action. Alikhu John, bhai, but the problem is here that we are using <laughs> antiplatelets <laughs> to <laughs> deactivate <laughs> the antiplatelet. Alikhu John, bhai, we are using the antiplatelets to deactivate, to less activation of the antiplatelet, not the numbers. So here also there is a controversy there. There are lots of, because when we are asking this yes. question, even among the hematologists, nobody is giving a clean cut answer. Even in the guidelines, these are not written. So according to the patient's condition, according to the physician's discretion, right. and also the clinical conditions, these should be kept in mind while doing these things. That yeah, the platelet count is 45,000. No, I'm not going to do it. It's not like this. The thing is that if the patient is, is just grieving for okay. a primary PCI needs uh, a immediate primary PCI, that one is the most important thing. We can we can, we can correct the platelet count later on by giving the platelet extracts or something like this later on. Because but 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 should be should be the morphine the should be considered yeah, the hematologist. Yeah, that's, that, is, yeah, yeah, that is yeah. that is the thing. That is yeah. the thing. Even you know, the, sometimes, the fellows, sometimes the hematologists yeah. disorder it. Sometimes yeah, even hematologist yeah. is not going to give an answer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that's thank, true. You. thank you. We are we are running short uh, with two and a half hours time. Thank you, Dr. Falakoyan, mm -hmm. for excellent presentation. Lots of faculties, uh, senior professor. Uh, late night. We are really I P D grateful to you, everybody. Uh, our next lecture, our next uh, lecture is very much interesting for the fellows also faculties. Uh, here is the one of the experts, Dr. 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 Ranjan Shetty, his talk on interpretation of hemodynamics, proximity and pressure data. It is the most, uh, I think he's the one of the best person to talk about this interpretation of the hemodynamics and proximity and pressure data, Dr. Ranjan Shetty. He will talk on 29th October at 9 p.m. I think everybody will be there. Uh, I'm requesting Professor Badu, sir, please come to the session. Uh, I think it's already been too late. But this was a very lively presentation, a very lively debate about different points. And different aspects, different controversial issues have come out. And why somebody is doing what, those things have also been discussed. I think. This is a forum where we can heartily disagree with one another from academic point of view. And that's very good. And I like it because we have to have very good interactive debate, intellectual debate about many points. Not all the things are settled with new knowledge, new direction are coming out. So thank you everybody. Thank you Dr. Khaliku Jamal. And thank you, the honorable panelists, for your very active participation. Thank you, audience. Good night, everybody. Thank you, sir. Professor, thank you, madam. It's still at late night. <laughs> Get you, Professor, madam. Thank you, madam. We are really grateful to you. Welcome. You are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bexim Bukharma. They are doing team in the last five months. Uh, I think at 2 o'clock, their team is working with us. Thank you, Bexim Bukharma. Thank you, everybody. See you on 29th October, Thursday at 9 p.m. with an expert panel, expert speaker on hemodynamics. I think hemodynamics is most important. Uh, everybody, I'm also inviting everyone on the ECT lecture we'll be having on Saturday at 9. At tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, ECG. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you. Arif, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Assalamualaikum. Madam, for the office. Assalamualaikum, sir. Assalamualaikum.